Hey guys, so what's been happening in the hobby this week? Well, I thought we'd have a bit of a discussion on uh, multi-figure compositions, you know, in your minis. So Games Workshop, as uh, I've noticed, has, you know, increasingly produced uh, designs that involve more than one, like, miniature on, on, the, on the base, or, you know, multiple elements, creatures, and so on, and they can be pretty hard to tackle, and I thought uh, this week we'd have a bit of a chat on maybe some approaches to painting them, a little bit of art theory, and uh, just go through some of that, and maybe some, uh, yeah, just different strategies that you can use to, uh, to complete them, so that you don't get sort of bamboozled by all of the detail and everything that's going on there, and there, there are some really good, um, you know, uh, rules and, and art theory that you can use as a guideline to help you uh, finish them off. So if we have a look, uh, I've just completed this little uh, model here, Bella Dharma, and I've just uh, done the tutorial for her, which is um, on the channel right now, if you want to see how I did this. Uh, the link will be in the top right hand corner there. And basically, you know, you'll see the way I sort of tackled it. And this with uh, Radhika the Beast, which I'm going to go through today. Uh, so while we're talking, I'll uh, give you some sped up footage of me painting this one. And then at the end, we'll do a little bit of a comparison, because these are really epitomize the two extremes of GW models or miniatures in general general of these multi-figure type of uh, compositions and these two particularly are good because they're both doing a similar thing they're in a triangular formation but one is a very large model as the centerpiece the focal point and the other is a very small one which is actually the smallest um, object in that composition and yet the focus so they've both got their ups and downs when it comes to um, you know uh, well problems uh, per se uh, and, and how to resolve it and so I thought that'd be really fun so we'll go through and I'll paint this one up as, as we're chatting and then we'll have a little bit of a look at the end and, and see and see whether I've gone you know how, how I've gone and how and how I've managed to resolve that so I thought that'd be really cool so I guess um, let's get started hey okay so multi-figure compositions well, what does it really mean and what, what am I really talking about? Well, you know, the composition just basically refers to, you know, the the distribution of objects, you know, within a scene, right? So uh, basically, uh, for a, a nice layman way of putting it or a, or a simplistic way of, of, of putting it. And in terms of miniatures, we're looking at all the things that make up that miniature on the base. So, you know, that includes terrain pieces, the base itself, um, anything that's on there is going to contribute to that composition. And, you know, initially when you're when you're attacking these types of multi-figure ones, um, like Games Workshop has these days, quite a few of them, you know, the, you, you want to sort of uh, give yourself a little, you know, plan of attack. And that's where I think we begin with this. You know, one of the, the best things you can do is not just jump in and just start painting it. You want to give yourself a little bit of time to have a think about it because that's really going to help you in, in achieving a better result. Because one of the, the biggest pitfalls or the dangers of multi-figure compositions, you know, when you're painting them is that you're going to end up focusing attention on areas which are not as important. And so by the time you get to the focal point, which you may not even realize is the focal point, um, you know, spoiler, it's the face, uh, generally speaking, um, of the main figure, um, you might be already worn out or already, you know, spent way too much time on other areas. And so then you rush through that, that part. So there's a few strategies, a few planning elements that you can do to help you resolve this so that you don't end up either rushing through or not paying attention to the areas that really matter. So things like painting, you know, the underside of something that no one sees, you know, spend more time on that than the main area around the face or whatever, right? Um, and that could be for a number of reasons why you do that. Usually um, these things tend to be to do with avoidance of, of something that's hard, namely uh, painting flesh. Um, most characters and most of these multi-figure compositions generally have exposed faces, not helmets on and so on. So you're, you're forced to actually, you know, put a bit of work into that area to really make it, make it pop. And I, I guess, so what are those strategies? What's the plan? Well, firstly, you decide, are you going to be painting this all together as one piece or in parts? And depending on your confidence level, you'll have to decide that. It doesn't really matter which way you go with that. Although I would say that painting in, in components, like in separate pieces, and then putting it together later, does pose a problem for... Um, seeing the overall structure and value, so the light and dark 
of all of the colors and things that you've got on that on that on that um, composition uh, may be out of whack a little bit right so you won't know until you put them together so I would normally suggest where possible try to put it all together as much as you can so as you're painting you can see what's going on across the entire figure as you're watching me paint this you'll notice that I actually attack the base first and I'm establishing a lot of the surrounding elements before I, I come on to attacking the main figure and there's a reason for that because it's setting a, uh, a tonal range that I now know is what's competing with the focal point which is the main figure and and around the face so I'm sort of establishing the darks and the mid-tones first before I go in so plan of attack you know that brings me on to thinking about um, you know tonal range and values before you even think about color what's going to be the brightest thing and what's going to be the darkest thing so that's where you move into your next your next stage of planning which is okay so I'm going to put all this together as much as possible and I'm going to figure out what's going to be brightest and what's going to be darkest and when you have multi figures what you don't want is a small secondary figure or element to be much brighter than the main figure and the air and, and most importantly the focal point of that figure so you know what you really have to do now is you're planning out that brightest to darkest that also includes deciding what is the focal point uh, that's a really important feature of that so you, you have to figure out where's where do you want your viewer the viewer that's looking at this your your opponent when you're playing a game or whoever's picking up this model even yourself where do you want their eye to be drawn and so with most figurative work you know um, which governs almost all miniatures even if they're a creature they'll usually have a face something that is face like eyes you know something that has you know uh, a an area of, of attention right for, for a, a, some kind of you know I guess bipedal or whatever creature whether it's human or otherwise generally there's a face and that's the most important that's what we associate with human beings associate with this is part of art theory when, when, you're, when you're painting pictures or illustration or anything else or sculpting you know the face is, is by far the most important especially if it's a human being or near human and so that is really the focus and and this and then you'll have secondary focal points it might be around the face it might be a weapon it might be something else that's maybe illuminating light or, or whatever right so you've got a, a range of secondary elements that might be also focuses but they have to sort of uh, complement whatever that main that main focus is namely the face so you've gone okay that's going to be the brightest so then you don't want the let's say on the one that I'm painting here the skin tones to be exactly the same as as the main figure so they'll be possibly a little darker or a little less contrasty than the the main figure itself so that they sort of get pushed into the background what you really want is the surrounding area to be pushed into the background and have that main figure come forward and the facial area be quite bright and quite contrasting so basically saying that there's a lot more dark and lights in a, in a tighter space than um, anywhere else on the figure and this will give you um, that pop that we always talk about so contrast so there's contrast of value which is light and dark and then there's contrast of color okay so that brings us on to the next part of this is choosing the colors so we've decided on we know what we're doing we're, we've set our tonal ranges the other elements are going to be darker the main figure is going to be brighter there's going to be more contrast we know that the focal point is the face we're going to uh, spend some time there um, we're now going to choose our colors and so this is where things like looking at a color wheel looking at your selection of colors that you have in your collection what can you make out of that I, I talk about the limited palette idea in one of my other talks where we go into um, you know pick, picking colors that you like and picking a small selection from what you already have or near already have so you don't have to buy too many and then trying to create something out of that and and the first step is taking a look at that color wheel and seeing you know if you've never done that I would highly suggest it you Know, just have a little look and your complementary colors which are the colors that oppose each other they're on opposite sides of the color wheel they're often very good in 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 combination with one another now you can't um, so part of color theory is, is that if you layer those they they neutral they go neutral they go gray or they or they muddy out now miniature paints all have multiple pigments inside of them so you can't this is not always true but generally speaking complementary colors uh, cancel each other out so they're good next to each other and the reason for that is that if you look at it on a micro level those paints the uh, are graying out at the join where they meet and that creates separation and so they both 
seem more vibrant next to each other. They don't blend into one another, right? So like, for instance, like green blending in through blue or, um, you know, red blending up to orange, you know, those aren't complementary colors, okay? They're sympathetic colors that, that, that blend into one another. So you, you'll pick maybe a, a complementary color. And so also, with complementary colors, one is going to be more dominant over the course of, over the whole of the figure, and one is going to be secondary, more like a a um, an accent color or something like that that's going to accent the overall all color scheme. So you're not going to have equal amounts of both of these. So you're going to choose maybe some uh, contrasting color that you can use that is going to make everything bright, and that will generally be somewhere around the main part of the figure. And then you're going to choose all of your little complementary colors that go along that. And what what are those colors? Well, they're the colors that are going to be either side of your main complementary color. So if you're going to do mostly blues, then you'll look at the colors that are next to blue and you'll probably use a few of those. And, and they'll be your main color palette with one or two small colors on the opposite side of the wheel for your little pop colors or accents. So that could be just, you know, let's say, um, on uh, on this model that I'm painting, you know, something that could be um, a pop color or something that will draw your attention might be some um, tattoos on the face, right? This is a bestial a vampire that you might have a, a tattoo and, and that could be in the, in the opposite color, right? So that draws your eye straight to the face and that color won't really be anywhere else on the model. So it, it gives you that, that interest straight away to go towards it. This is also true of the Belladama model that I that I painted. I, I put a magenta tone on the scarf that surrounds around her neck uh, near her face, and it's really the only place that you see that color, and so instantly your eye goes towards it. She's also framed by that woolly part of her jacket, and that's a sort of bony green color, and that also is one of the only places you see that color around the model, and so instantly you have a frame and 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 high contrast, and your eye generally moves towards the top of the figure. So you're going to be looking for those types of little Little moments on your figure, where can you add a little accent of color that's going to draw the eye towards that face and that area? And then you'll then you'll start to develop a color palette and you can move on from there. So now you've really got all the elements at your disposal. You've got, you know, you've decided on how you're going to build this and how many pieces you're going to, you've already decided on, on the value structure. You know, the supporting elements are a little bit in more than mid to dark tones and the main figure is going to be with the full range of light to dark. You've got the focal point, you know what's going to be going on there, that's going to have the brightest and darkest tones. You've got your pop, your, your pop color to make it stand out, focus on that area. You've got all of your complementary colors and supporting, you know, sympathetic colors next to that that are going to help support the whole color scheme. You know, you've looked at your color wheel or, at, you know, other art images or other miniatures to get some ideas. You've you've got your, your, your little inspiration that you're going to go with and your idea that obviously fits into your army or if it's a single figure, maybe it's just a, um, you know, um, for display or whatever. In either case, you know, you're, you're pretty much ready to go. And that's that's where I just alluded to that the final stage is inspiration. So, um, you know, if you're struggling or you're trying to figure that out, have a little look on the internet and, you know, search around for people that might have done examples of, of something that you're thinking about. So you might see colors that you like, you know, already done on a figure that might even be similar or even the same. And take a look at other people's approach to that figure or to uh, a vibe or a or a something that, that gets you in the mode of what this is. So a lot of artists will do mood boards where they'll just pick a bunch of artworks from around the internet and create a collage that they look at as inspiration, not to copy, but just to um, give them give them a, a sense or a mood or a feeling of either the color palette that they want to use or, you know, the, the sort of, yeah, the, the, the sensibility they want to bring to the artwork that they're doing. And that can work for miniature painting as well. You can set up a little mood board or a bunch of images on your, on your computer, just have them next to you. And every now and again, you have a little look and that reminds you of what, what you're doing. And this is a great way to get into color theory and get into breaking out of the usual uh, way that you might approach something. It's not always about technique exactly. Sometimes it's about just um, a sensibility or a way of approaching uh, the work that can often open up new, new, new gateways and new doorways for you into, into new ideas. Um, and, and this is more and more the case, the, the better you get at painting, right? The, the technique becomes less and less important and the 
intention behind the technique becomes way more important. You know, what you're really trying to get across, what you're trying to say, you know, the voice behind your work. And that's that's something that, that, that slowly develops and becomes more and more to the fore, even if you don't realize it, even if you're a pure gamer or you just paint these for fun. If you really have analyzed your work over the course of years, you'll notice that you're going to do this anyway naturally, even if you don't consciously do it. But it's much, much better if you start to bring it into a conscious element of your painting process because then, like I've said before with limited palettes and other things, once you have intention behind your actions and you know, you consciously know what you're trying to go for, this is far better and gives you a much, much greater chance of success, at least in my opinion, than always making it automatic and, and unconscious or whatever. So there's just some nice thoughts for you to think about in attacking uh, multi-figure compositions and just trying to break it down simply so that you can, you can then work towards it. So um, I hope this has helped you. Uh, let's now take a look at um, the uh, the Radhika, the Beast, and my my Bella Dharma, and we'll take a little bit of a look at how I've gone and um, where I might have gone right, or whether where, where there's improvements and so on. And we'll do a little bit of a compare and contrast um, just to see because these two figures are on the opposite sides of the spectrum. One is a large figure, as I said, with with some small supporting elements, and the other one is a very very small figure with a lot of large supporting elements. Um, but the process is practically the same. One, you've got to be careful not to let them get lost. That's the small figure, Belladama. And then the other one is not for the Radhika the Beast to get lost in the details across that broad surface of that figure because it's very large. You can get caught up in the armor and all kinds of little details and make them all too extravagant. And, and then you don't have any focal point. You know, you lose, you lose sight of what's important. So there are those two dangers there between those two that we can have a look at and, and compare and contrast. So um, let's take a look at it. Okay, so let's take a look and see how I've gone. So, you know, uh, Radhika, I think, has, has come up pretty well. We've got all of the all of those colors down in, in what I've been talking about. And if we compare it to uh, Belladama here and we take a look, we can see that both of these figures are doing a similar thing. They're in a triangular formation uh, composition. On the, on the right hand, we've got Belladama as the smallest uh, element in that composition and the focal point. And on uh, the left here, we've got Radhika, where is the largest element. And, and they're both they're both in this kind of similar way. And so I've attacked it in a, in a similar fashion. But um, if you notice, if you watch the Belladama video compared to Radhika here, um, you'll notice that I, I attacked Radhika first uh, rather than the secondary figures. And with Belladama, I actually did the walls first before I did her. And that's because um, they're sort of there's different reasons to do that. Uh, for, for Radhika here, there's so many details on him that can influence the overall composition that I really needed to establish the lightest lights and, and colors and so on. Whereas with Belladama, um, it was more important to make sure that I maintained uh, the mid-tones and the darks so that I knew how light I could go for her. It's kind of a different kind of process, but overall you can see that, you know, by attacking it in, in this way, you can end up with something that really does draw your eye towards the focus, which is the face. You know, all of the most interesting details, color, variety, and so on are, are at the top of this composition on both pieces. And if we take a closer look at Radhika now, and we just take, take a little bit of a look, we can see how simple I've done those, those, those little vampires. There's not a huge amount of detail on them, and this is a, the best position here. You can see how much more variety there is in that leg compared to this little little vampire. And so it's drawing your eye away from that and, and towards, towards the vampire and up towards the face. So I think that's like the, the main point here is just to, um, you know, really just focus your attention on what's important and leave the other details you know to fall away into the background so that you're focusing on on the main on the main figure so yeah i hope that's helped i'll leave an overview and you know close-up photos and so on at the end and i hope that that you get something out of this it was a, a pleasure to uh to paint these figures and to and to do this uh, for you so i hope you like it and uh please hit that like button subscribe button if you have and i guess i'll uh, catch you on the next one